Hello everyone. How are you? I hope you're doing well. Welcome to this webinar on behalf of the TEFL Org about teaching young learners. My name's Carl. I'm going to be your host for the next sort of 50 minutes um, where I'm going to be mainly talking about teaching young learners. Um, just sort of an overview really. I'm not going to go into lots and lots of detail. Just give an overview of teaching young learners. But this is a live webinar. And if you do have any questions at all about anything that I'm saying, or if you just want to say hello and let, let us know where you are in the world, I can see some people already doing that. I'm in Northern Ireland and um, where I work as a tutor. I work um, as a teacher trainer here for the TEFL org. So if you have a practical weekend course in Northern Ireland, you'll spend it with me. Um, I also work as an examiner and an online teacher. I've been lucky enough to have lived in many and taught in many places around the world over the last almost 20 years. Anyway, I can see some hellos coming in. That's enough about me. Hello, Franz in Seville. How are you? Um, en Enkeleda in Albania. I've probably not said your name right at, at all. I'm sorry, Enkeleda, but hello. There. Thanks for joining us. Catherine in France, Yanis in Florida, Rashid, hi. Uh, Nigeria, we've got Thomas in Madrid, Felma in the UK, Gabrielle in Germany. All the hellos. Please let us know where you are in the world. And if you've got any questions at all about teaching English as a foreign language, please do put them in the chat. I will try and answer them. Or if not, Alan, who's monitoring the chat, will put in a link or he'll get to the answer a bit more quickly. So let's get on to teaching young learners. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of an overview of teaching young learners. And it's really aimed at people who are sort of new to teaching English as a foreign language, but I'm hoping that everybody will get something out of this. Um, if you've got anything experience in teaching young learners, please do put that in the chat. Um, please if you agree or disagree with me, or if you've got any sort of stories where you've, you've heard something like I've said, please also put that in the chat. It's much better if we can all sort of learn from each other. So teaching young learners. So first of all, I'm gonna talk a bit about the sort of jobs um, and the places really that you might teach young learners when you um, work as an EFL teacher around the world. So I'm not really going to talk about countries because really young learners, they learn in all countries, obviously. So I can't really sort of say, oh, if you want to teach young learners, go to what, this country or go to that country. Really, you know, pick a country you want to go to. Don't because and when you get there, you'll find jobs with young learners. And probably the most common way of teaching English as a foreign language is at a language school. So this is a private school owned by a company or owned by an individual where they employ teachers and they have lots of different classes. And probably a big chunk of those classes will be teaching young learners. Now, young learners tend to be sort of under the age of 18, really. That tends to be what we class as a young learner, so 17 down. Some schools, they do say once you get to 16, you move to an adult class, but generally classes tend to be sort of below the age 18. So you, you work at a language school and they will have face-to-face -face classes. They might have some online classes, but they tend to have face-to-face -face classes. You'll be teaching some adults and you'll be teaching some young learners. And the, the students, the, the, the kids, the children, the teenagers, they usually come once or twice a week to this school. They don't tend to, but I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but they don't tend to come every day to this language school. They tend to maybe come on a Saturday morning or they tend to come um, uh, on a Sunday or they tend to come after school, uh, from after their main school that they go to in their own country. Yeah. So they're sort of extra classes to school. My daughter, she does a Spanish class after school on a Thursday. For example, I take her to a college um, around the corner and she learns Spanish for an hour. This tends to be what happens with young learners when they're learning English because most young learners also get English work, English um, uh, studies at their own high school or their primary school. Yeah. So that's that's the first sort of main job. You go work at a language school. But there are jobs where you actually go and work in the local school that's owned by the government or could be sort of a private school um, that's, that the students go to from sort of 8 a.m. till three o'clock, something like that. So 
I would fly to Japan, for example. I would go to a town and I would go and work in the local high school or the local primary school. And quite often these um, jobs come through schemes such as the JET program in Japan. There's also some of these in Korea. There's also um, some of these in the United Arab Emirates. But also sometimes um, a private language school will actually send you to the local high school. So you'll have a contract with the private language school, but they sort of outsource you to the local high school or the local primary school. OK, so that tends to be that sort of thing. And, and generally you work with a local teacher. Now, sometimes you work yourself. So I could be in a class in China at a high school with 20, 30 Chinese students totally on my own. But very often you also work with a local teacher or you work with a local um, a classroom assistant. OK, hope this is making sense. Please do put some questions in. Connor, fantastic question. I'm actually going to get to that in a bit. OK, um, now the other way of working, uh, which is from working online. So you sit. I'm in Northern Ireland. I would sit on Zoom. I'd sit on Microsoft Teams. I would sit on the program that the school is employing me to use. And we talk uh, and I teach the students this way. And this can be sort of either you're here in your office, your spare room, whatever it might be. But the students are all in one room together. So you are looking through the camera and you're looking on your screen at a group of, let's say, five, six students all together in one room and you're teaching them that way. Or it can be students in that own room. So you would teach, you you know, like uh, you'd have lots of little screens come up, hopefully no more than sort of five or six, but who knows how many you would have. And, you know, you'd have top left corner would be one student, next to them would be another student and the next student. They are in their own house, in their own room. OK, so that's the sort of different jobs that you might have teaching young learners. Okay. Now, a little bit about class structures. Now, hopefully. The young learners will be divided into age groups, hopefully. Now, this doesn't always happen. And some schools have different ranges in the ages. But generally, there should be uh, students that are aged three to six. I know three is young, but I've I've been in schools. I've worked in schools where there's three year olds, believe it or not. I think that's too young myself, but lots of schools do take them on. Um, and hopefully the school that you go to work for would group the students together by age and three to six it should be an, it should be one age group. Then they should sort of say seven to ten together. Then maybe sort of ten to 14 is, is quite often another um, age group. And then um, 14 to 18 tends to be another. So because obviously what teaching a group of six year olds is very different from teaching a group of 14, 15 year olds. And I think it's important at an interview, if you have one, to sort of find out if they're doing this, because I would say it's very, very difficult to teach a mixed age group. I think it's almost easier to teach a mixed ability group than it is to teach a mixed age group. Then hopefully within those age groups, they have ability, they have ability levels. So within that, they will have ability levels. So, I mean, for three to six and seven to 10, they don't tend to do this so much for ability levels. But for 10 to 14 and 14 to 18, hopefully, hopefully they're divided into beginner elementary together, maybe pre-intermediate, intermediate together, and then maybe an advanced class. So hopefully you've got different levels within those age groups. OK. So what do you teach? You're, you've got a job. And I'm going to talk a bit about the application process in a bit, but hopefully you've, you've got a job and you want to know what to actually do in the classroom. So every school online, face to face, working in a language school, working in um, working in a high school, working in a primary school, they should have a syllabus. Now, some schools put a lot of effort into their syllabus. 
Um, some schools have a syllabus that comes from the government. Uh, some schools don't really have a syllabus. They just sort of have just general topics that you should do. But there should be some sort of guidance from the management of the school to tell you what to teach. Some will have planned lessons. So some will say, OK, come work for us. Your lessons are already planned. All you need to do is online download these materials. Or working face to face, you go to this room, you can pick up the materials, you do some photocopying, then you're ready to go. So some, but not all, will have planned lessons. Again, something that, that, that if that's worrying you, if the planning is worrying you, might be something to think about in the interview. Ask them, first of all, if they have a syllabus and then they might tell you if they've got planned lessons. Some schools will have a textbook and there are benefits and there are disadvantages to teaching from a textbook. But some schools might say, OK, here is a textbook. You're going to teach that this term. OK, some students have a focus of working towards a specific exam. There are exams that are taken globally for young learners, such as the Trinity exams for example <clears throat> some older ones might be working towards the IELTS exam um, some might be working working towards a local um, exam that's set by their government or their their education board that kind of thing so just you know there will be some students that are there for to take an exam not really there necessarily to have so much fun although hopefully some fun but they will be working towards an exam and I do think it's important to ask this in an interview if there's a if you're stuck especially to say what um, have you got any questions for us at the end of an interview this is the kind of thing to ask or what's the aim of the students what's the um, have you got a syllabus that you work from that kind of thing all right because it gives you an idea of what you'll be doing in the term that you go there so the basic content of a young learners lesson now it really does depend the age the level and the aim of the class so obviously if you've got a syllabus you'd think okay this week i need to do this so let's say for example this week we're talking about music and they need to know the vocabulary of music you would put a lesson together if they haven't already made it for you you put a lesson together where you talk about different genres of music for example what a lovely lesson that could be um, if it's kids, as in very young kids, sort of around six, seven years old, might be just very simple vocabulary, animals, hobbies, colours, something like that. And then obviously with, with the levels within them, it, it does change how whether you're going to be doing grammar, this kind of thing. So it's not very easy for me to say all young learners are like this, all classes like this. It does depend on these three aspects. But what tends to be and i would say in every young learner class i've ever done i have played some sort of game and there are loads and loads of efl games on our website if you sort of type into the blog page our website um tefl.org if you um go in the blog page you, you look at some um type in young learners you'll find things like this uh, if you do one of our add on modules that we offer here in Young Learners, they'll tell you about games. OK, there's a massive range of games that you can do, but most of them can be tweaked towards the vocabulary that you're doing. OK, so if you want to do a bit more research, look online for that kind of thing. EFL language games, songs, depending on the age, um, you know, you might do nursery rhymes with kids young kids um moving through to doing songs about i was about to show my age then ed sheeran is he common is he um is he uh is he i can't even say the word is he current ed sheeran yes i think he is or am i showing my age there um you know you could do songs like that yeah um i once tried to introduce my azerbaijani teenagers to the beatles they had no idea who these these people were that i was trying to show them and the lesson didn't go overly well. They didn't really like the Beatles. Um, lots and lots of vocabulary work. Loads and loads of vocabulary work for young learners. I'd say that probably the focus of 
you can learn a lesson sheet, vocabulary and skills, sort of speaking about this vocabulary, writing about this vocabulary, listening and reading about this vocabulary more than grammar. The, the young learners you teach tend to have quite good grammar lessons um, in their high school or their primary school. Yeah. So, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to teach some grammar. Anthony, thank, I'm just seeing your comment come up there. You sting. Uh, sting was a anyone who doesn't know sting was a, a very very popular singer in the 70s and 80s definitely the 80s you sting as an example in your coursework today um i hope everything you did was magic anthony um lots of vocabulary work lots simple phrases especially with the young kids around that vocabulary so for example um you know if they're talking about hobbies you could teach them the phrase i like doing I like doing painting. I like doing singing. I like doing um, football, things like this, or I don't like doing. So these sort of simple phrases that you can get the students speaking that they can sort of remember. OK, um, and some reading and some videos that interest them. So, you know, I, the sort of thing that I like reading about is probably quite different um, from what the average 15 year old around the world likes reading about. Um, young learners, six years old. I keep saying young learners because I've got a daughter about that age and that's how I think of a young learner. Um, uh, six, seven year olds, they, they, you know, they like to watch sort of cartoons, maybe some, um, you know, uh, British cartoons or American cartoons, something from Nickelodeon or Disney or something like that, um, that they would find interesting. You can maybe do some vocabulary work around that. Kids' classes should be they should be given homework. Parents love it when their kids come home with homework. So give them homework. Yeah, plan some homework in. Now, what are some of the possible young learner problems that you might have? And the first one from what I've been, um, for my students, the, sorry, my trainee teachers that come to me, when I talk about young learners, um, they say they quite often worry about keeping control of the um, the students. They're worried that they're going to be dropped in China or they're going to be get on the plane and land in Italy and the kids are going to be totally out of control, running around like crazy and they don't know how to keep in control. Yeah. Now, what I would say is that young learners are better behaved than you fear. I have never really had any major classroom control problems in the young learners I've taught in Japan, China, um, Sri Lanka. Uh, now, Spain and Italy, they can be a little bit more boisterous. Personally, I don't mind that. I quite like students, to, teenagers, for example, to, to be sort of a, be, to be talking. Now, there are problems, obviously, that can come with that, but I bet you, that wherever you go in the world, they're not as badly behaved as you think they will be. Yeah. Now, there are um, arguments about doing some sort of reward system. I do tend to use one. So I would split the group, the class up into tables. I give them names. So, for example, I could give them British football teams. I could give them the name of singers. Uh, I could give them colours, whatever it might be. And I I put a, a little scoreboard on a, on a blackboard or I put a scoreboard on a whiteboard and I say, OK, this is the, the good behaviour and one point. Oh, no, you were badly behaved, taken off a point. And then, you know, the class at the end gets to choose the music or something like that. So there are reward systems. Now, there are pros and cons. Some people don't like using reward systems. But I tend to do use them in classroom. OK, the other way of doing it, and I think this can work with reward systems, is you do some sort of contract with the students. Uh, depends on the age. But, you know, you could you could have a little contract up on a piece of paper or if you're doing it online, it could be on a shared document <clears throat> where you talk about, um, you know, the, the, some of the rules you want to have in the class. No eating, no mobile phone use, whatever it might be. And they have to sort of sign the contract. If they then break that rule, you can point at it and say, look, you signed this contract. You're now doing this. 
don't do this again, point off, whatever it might be. You can combine the contracts and reward systems. Now, the other thing that can be an aspect of teaching young learners is, is having a distracted student. So you've sort of got a student that sort of drifts off on their own, looking around, and there might be reasons that they're doing it. OK, and I, I think probably the main reason is that your classes need a bit of a change of pace. Online or face to face, the classes tend to um, you need to have some activities that are a bit quick, where there's sort of a, quite a bit of speaking or there's some sort of game element to it. And then maybe someone that's a bit slower where they do some reading or they do some writing. Kids like it when the classrooms change in pace to keep them on their toes a bit. So that could be the reason why they're distracted. And one of the ways of keeping this change of pace is to do a range of different activities. So that could be within the skills, you do a listening, you do a speaking, you do a reading, you do a writing. Um, so that could be that could be that. But obviously within that, there's lots of different types of writing activities you can do. There's different um, questions you could ask amongst the reading. There are um, different activities you could do with grammar where they have to play a game around it. That would speed up the um, pace a little bit. So it does depend on uh, the sort of activities you're going to do. The other way, and I do this online as well, if they're in a group especially, is move them around a bit. So you can say, right, you're um, Pierre and Miguel, your partners. Right, next activity, Pierre, you're going to be um, Abdul's partner, like that. You keep swapping them around, move them around, keep them on their toes a bit so they haven't really got time to sort of settle properly and you know they're always sort of wondering what's going to happen next move them around a bit uh give them some responsibility if you've got a disruptive student uh, sorry if you've got a distracted student uh sort of say okay right um we're gonna do a little group activity now um don't say that they're away and looking away but you know pick them and go right okay pierre you're going to be the the person writing for this activity uh, everyone, you've got a feedback to Pierre, what you're going to say. All of a sudden, Pierre is having to do something. OK, give them some responsibility. And finally, I can just sort of check, are your lessons boring? If your lessons are boring, then the kids are going to be distracted. Now, it can be difficult if someone's planned the lesson for you and you don't really sort of agree with it. Um, that can be difficult to go off topic and plan your own activities. But I really do think, you know, look at yourself a little bit here and don't, oh, these students are so distracted. Oh, they're so, I'm not getting anything from them. Maybe your lessons are boring. I hate to say it, but maybe they are. Right, shy kids. And this is something that I've been asked in an interview quite a bit. How would you get a shy kid or a quiet kid to start talking? So shy kids. First thing I would say is that some kids and some cultures especially are not used to talking within a class. They might be at a school where they're not allowed to talk. So they might go to their local high school, their local primary school at eight o'clock. They're expected to sit there, not move around, not talk too much, not talk back to teacher, not maybe even answer questions. Terrible, I know, but they might not be allowed to do this. And then all of a sudden they're put in front of uh, a person they've never or hardly know. And that person's asking them to to sort of speak out loud or is in their face asking them a question. They're shy, they're nervous, they do it. So just be a bit aware of that, okay? Um, first thing I think is you've got to learn their names as, as, as much as you can, try and nominate them a bit. And a part of that also sort of comes along the lines of just doing lots of pair work, doing lots of group work. They might, people don't like talking out loud in front of a class. and you know, some people are like it, some people don't. Put them into pairs and, you know, while they're doing some pair work, just hover a little bit around the shy, quiet one and see if they are making some uh, English. If they're not, then maybe just go in a little, help them a little bit. Um, you know, just, I think, easy, easy. Don't pick on them too much, but, you know, just easy, easy, be kind, be nice. And hopefully, after a few lessons, they stop being so shy. The key, I do think, is though, is pair and group work. That, that tends to be the key to a good lessons for adults and kids, getting them speaking quite a bit. So let's talk a bit about working online. I'm going to come to bits of jobs in a minute. If you're working online, you need energy. Oh, it's really difficult to teach a class while you're sat back like that. 
you need to have energy you need to sort of be up and you know you need to be in the camera a bit and you sort of be hi how are you and smiling and things like that maybe even try standing up you need some sort of props that you're going to talk about if you're doing a lesson on if you're doing a lesson on food can you get some little props to sort of show this kind of thing um you know keeping them what's that the teacher's got oh wow that's amazing you know you show this what's that kind of thing uh online pace changes as well again you know getting them to speak a bit more getting them to work in pairs then do a little reading activity uh, do a typing activity something like that pace changes can work online use breakout rooms with the kids um difficult if if they're sort of below sort of the age of 10 maybe but teenagers that kind of thing you know put them into little groups and and get them to do little activities you can jump into that group breakout rooms that kind of thing if they're all there in one room you sort of could can you get them to move can you get them to get up walk around run around so you could for example say right everybody go to that side of the classroom they all go over there then you say right okay run to the other side if this sentence is grammatically correct something like that get them to sort of move around a bit this kind of thing um and, you know, I, I really do think about teaching standing up if you're working online. It can be quite easy to sort of slouch back in your chair. If you're working online, if you're standing up, I think it can give you a bit more energy. So job applications. Just going to get through this last one and I'm going to get to your questions. So you found a job on our website, tefl.org. You put on the job center and you um, have found a young learners one you want. OK, and basically you apply. Do exactly what it says. Now, some they'll get you to do some make up a video. Some will just get you to send a CV. Do exactly what it says on the job um, uh, blurb that it has there. Get in your application. But then you might need to do an intro video. And this tends to be something like where you record it onto YouTube and you send them a link. You can send them a private link on YouTube that only they can open. Um, and where you talk about yourself. You, you sort of say why you want to be a teacher. We've done videos, we've done webinars about this. So if you, this is the sort of thing you want to know more about, go back and have a look on YouTube or Facebook for them. Some sort of intro video. Uh, then uh, you might have to do a live practice lesson. And in an ideal world, that would be a couple of kids. But sometimes the practice lesson can be some adults sort of pretending to be kids. Uh, not as in they talk like a little baby, but like they're sort of sat there and you'd say, right, OK, we do this activity. We do this activity, work together, do that. They're just sort of seeing how you manage people. OK, um, now the key thing amongst all of this is to show that you are friendly. If you're doing it and you're looking really scared, they're not going to give you the job. If if you if you do a pretty good lesson, you know, the key thing is to smile, show that you're nice, have a good voice, that kind of thing. Grade your voice, especially with kids. Don't talk in your normal pace of voice where you're talking really quickly like this. You might need to slow down. You might need to um, make sure your pronunciation is on point and correct. This kind of thing. Grade your voice a little bit. Um, and quite simply, in your practice lesson, teach something. Don't try and go to like, oh, today you were going to learn the third conditional in the next 10 minutes. You know, teach them some vocabulary, teach them a simple grammar point, something like that. Simple grammar point. Don't go into too much detail. OK. Thank you, everybody. Um, I could see all the questions, which is lovely. Thank you very much. Please, if you've got any comments at all about anything you've just heard or anything you've just seen, please do put it in the chat. I'm going to get to some of the questions now. Um, hello, Connor. How are you doing? Uh, Connor Morland, um, do you have any tips for discipline in the classroom for a new teacher? Right. So what I would say, Connor, is that um, first of all, they will I think they will respond to you if you're nice and friendly, if you're a new teacher. OK, if you know, if if they can show if you can show them that you're treat, treating them fairly, that kind of thing, they tend to do what you want them to do. I use the reward system that I spoke about in the presentation just now. I think that works OK. You might not be happy doing that sort of thing, but I think for a beginning teacher, I think it could be quite good. Um, kids are competitive and 
they like to sort of police themselves. If one student keeps losing them points, and this is going to not allow them to choose the YouTube video they watch or listen to the song they want, um, then, you know, they police themselves a bit. So I think that that will work quite well. Um, I don't think be too strict. I don't like to be super, super strict. You know, I, I think tend to just sort of be nice, be friendly. That gets you quite far, you know. But don't be a pushover. If someone's mucking around, take them to one side. Don't I don't like to shout at well, I don't shout anyway. No one should shout. I don't like to reprimand them in front of the whole class. I personally think it's much more effective to say, okay, Pierre, can you come here? I need to talk to you. The class goes silent, that kind of thing. You take them outside and you sort of say to them, look, do you think this is good behaviour? This kind of thing. I find that quite works quite well. Uh good luck though, Connor. Uh, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you? Hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining us, Elizabeth, as usual. Uh, does anyone know of some free or low cost online resources to share with total beginners? But if they are total beginners, then probably you just want to stick to quite simple vocabulary. And look, total beginners means really low level. You might want to look at something. You might want to look at some ESOL resources if they really are a low level. E S O L resources. Put that into Google. See what comes up. Um, really, you're sort of looking at simple vocabulary at that age, and then just some sort of simple stock phrases. Um, so have a look on our website to see if any of the resource packs that we offer look good. Or go to ESOL, I think it's ESOL Nexus, might be a good website, put that into Google, pardon me. Um, One Stop English might have some low level class lessons like that as well, Elizabeth. Good luck, okay. All the hellos were still coming in. Hello, Marzio in Rome, Roslyn in Italy, da David in Portugal, or oh, I wish I was in Portugal. Uh, Trace in Italy, hello. Uh, Lamita, hi. How would you go about your first teaching job after gaining a TEFL certificate? Good, good question. So first it depends what or where you want to teach. I would look for, personally, I would look for an established language school that tends to advertise a, is a, quite often. They tend to have quite good support networks for new teachers. If you're going to go abroad, obviously that sort of it does limit you a little bit because you can if you, there's a certain country that you want to go to or if there's a certain country that you can only go to because of your visa, um, you know, you've got to uh, really just that limits you a little bit. But I would if you've got your certificate in your hand, I would spend a bit of time looking at jobs in countries that you want to go to or if it's online companies that maybe look like they're quite reputable as in they've got maybe a website running or you've put their name to google and there's other teachers talking about how good they are and just and just go for it i've done um webinars about applying for jobs specifically about applying for jobs lama side go back and have a look at those see if any of those help you yeah how to find your first tefl job that kind of thing we've done webinars on so that might help you okay good luck ehab hi uh, some young learners have the idea that only teachers who are native speakers, this drives me mad, should teach them English. I saw really good, I read a really good article about this, Ehab, today in the ELT Gazette, which is a free newspaper, ELT Gazette. And there was a lady who was doing some PhD research that actually showed that since COVID, attitudes to this have changed quite a bit. And that actually a lot of young a lot of learners are actually more and more happy to be taught by local non-native, what is a native, that's a whole new, a different argument, teachers. Okay. Right. So, so that just took me off on a, on a tangent because it drives me mad this because you can get amazing non-native teachers. Uh, right. What should a non-native English speaking teacher do to deal with this such a situation? Right. It's, it's difficult to deal with prejudice and it is a prejudice right first thing yeah i think is just show them in your teaching ability don't try and fight it just say okay look that's your opinion but this is what we're doing today 
and you give them a great grammar lesson, you give them a great vocabulary lesson, and they're like, actually, wow, amazing. Get in, you know, some pronunciation activities. Don't be scared of that if you're a non-native teacher, because you've probably got a very high level of English. Uh, get in some error correction. So these students that think, oh, who's this na non-native trying to teach me? Get in some error correction and show that you know the language much better than them and you can really get them to improve. OK, the quality of your teaching quite simply have. And if they like your classes, if they feel that they're learning, if they feel that they're improving, this whole stupid non-native native thing goes out the window. I really wish you luck with it, Ehab, and I'm sorry that you're faced with it. OK, a um, little conversation going on there about Sting. I think there probably are people, Meryn, that haven't heard of Sting. You know, there probably are. Uh, and I feel sorry for them. Marzia, hi. Could we start from a popular song to talk to explain idioms and grammar or talk about? Yes, for sure. Songs can be a great starting point um, for conversation, for speaking tasks, for sure. Yep, grammar, definitely grammar, grammar, grammar. Get pick out some grammar points from the song. They do a fill the blank. You do from that. Idioms, yes, you know, but I, I you just be careful of that. It's not too full of idioms, I would say. Um, yeah, if you can find some songs with vocabulary for sure, definitely. Don't just play a song for the sake of playing some songs. You know, do a song that fits in with your lesson plan. Definitely, Marcia. Uh, on on your, on your Nietzsche, Nathan. Is it Nathan? It probably is Nathan. And just the name's running away. Hello. You enjoy teaching young learners. Good. On English schools and kindergartens in China. Great. Let us know a bit more of your experience, Nathan. Let us know what you thought. There we go. Give them responsibilities. Yes. Why not? If you feel like they can do that, for sure. Sh students love ordering other students about. You know, and as long as it doesn't get out of hand, that could be something that really works quite well. Uh, Franz, hello. You found it hard to keep control of young learners because you didn't speak Spanish very well. You didn't understand my instructions. So, right. Interesting. Uh, instructions are important online and are important in a classroom. Yeah. I had problems with my instructions when I first started. And what I used to do was write out my instructions in my lesson plan. So when I was like, OK, we're going to do this. Games can be quite hard to explain sometimes. I would write down briefly how to play the game and I would read it and say, right, this is what I'm going to say. Because it can be quite difficult with instructions. You can go on tangents, you can repeat yourself and then it gets a bit confusing. So first you write out the instructions. Secondly, and I think this is, should be done with instructions for adults and kids, but I think it's important for kids, is to do concept checking of the instructions. So you read out the instructions and you say, OK, Pierre, who are you working alone or in teams or, or teams? Yes. OK. Um, Maria, should you be writing or should you be reading? Oh, oh, reading. OK. Um, uh, Miguel, should you be working uh, on this sheet or that sheet or, you know, make sure that they understand what's going on. Who's going to go first? Who's going to go second? Keep them on their toes. Make sure they're listening. Yeah. I, Franz, don't have never, ever taught um, in an English lesson. Uh, I've never, ever spoken in their native language. I've only ever spoken in English. Own every country I've ever, ever worked in. It's possible. You just got a plan. Uh, good luck. Lavanna, you're in Namibia. Oh, I love Namibia. It's one of my favourite countries I've ever been to. Um, Anthony, what room sizes are we talking about? Well, how long's a piece of string? Uh, online, you now obviously they could be in their classroom, sorry, in their bedroom, but they could also be in like a small classroom. I've taught in really quite big classrooms where they can run around um, really well. I've also taught in quite cramped classrooms. You know, it really does depend, Anthony, where you're going to go. And I think it's it's important if you're going to be teaching young learners to know about the furniture and how you can move it around, that kind of thing. Franz, is it OK to send a disruptive student out of the classroom? I've never done this myself. I've taken them outside and spoken to them. But I've never sort of 
said, right, you out. I think you've kind of lost the battle when that happens. Um, what I would say, friends, is speak to your management. If there's a student that keeps being disruptive, then I think you can you can say to the, the, the manager, the director of studies, what do we do about this? And they'll tell you. Maybe you get your parent, maybe you get their parents in, maybe they don't come back. I don't know. Um, but I think if you're using the reward system right, if you've got a contract, if you're talking to them as a human, I think, you know, you, you shouldn't really be at a stage where you're sending them out. I have got five or six year olds to go sit in the corner by themselves. That's what's a little bit if they really are totally crazy. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, Philip, great book recommendation there. Thank you very much. Uh, Dora, uh, best result to speak of the teenagers on your website. Um, well, I think once it, if they get into quite high -ish level teenagers, um, do you think that they need to uh, uh, have any sort of major differences from adults in terms of what they're talking about? As long as the, the, the topic that they're talking about is, is fine, I think that's OK. You know, if that's something that's easy to them, something that's interesting to them, I think that's fine. You know, you could get them doing um, uh, presentations, that kind of thing. You could even get them doing debates. I've done that as well. It depends on the level. Um, have a look through any of the resources and see if they match what you're trying to teach, Dora. I don't think there's anything mildly, wildly different you need to do with teenagers. You know, just do it. It's more the topics that they're talking about. OK. Uh, Lamisa, hi. Uh, well, you need to create your own syllabus or lesson plan. You're usually given one. Every school I've ever worked at has given me one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, lesson plans you might need to create yourself, but syllabuses tend to be given to you. OK. Um, Amor, hi. Wow, this is an interesting one. You'd like to hear your advice on what to do in case one has to teach some young learners on Zoom who doesn't speak any English at all. What should I begin with? What if I don't speak the language? Right. First thing is, are they 100% don't speak any English? So they don't learn any English at their school, their high school, their primary school. Right. What should you begin with in that? If this is the case, it's just simple, simple vocabulary. You hold up a picture of a banana and you get them to say banana. Repeat after me. You drill individual words and you just have to start really, really slow. Listen, repeat, listen, listen, repeat. I like bananas. I like bananas. There we go. Get them to just repeat those kind of things and you just have to build up really, really slowly. Don't expect too much or more. Again, what you might help you if this is the case is to go to ESOL. That is a branch of English teaching English that, that deals with really quite low levels that might be your case but I would wonder if they're actually quite shy maybe you just haven't found the sort of thing that they like maybe you haven't you know given them sort of you know a song something like something that they are interested in try lots of different things don't lose art though and more yeah Again, I've taught really, really low levels and I don't I've never spoken a, lingu a language. I just use English. Really, really low levels. Listen, repeat, listen, repeat. OK. Uh, Dan, wouldn't it make kids more hostile towards their teammates? Uh, not hostile. They will police them and they, they, the other kids don't want, want to make them lose. it. Yeah. OK. Um, Liz, interesting question. What do you have a special needs student? Right. Um, well, really, in that case, hopefully you do sort of a range of activities and you find out you've got find something that they like and that's really interesting. them. Now, um, different schools around the world have different um, ways of doing this. So they tend to um, some give them a, a, a special teacher. Some don't. OK, so it does depend on that. But um, 
a special needs student, you know, really just sort of a range of activities, different types of look into learning types, uh, type that into Google learning types and you'll be able to find, you know, they might like some reading, but they might not like writing, that kind of thing. A range of activities, Liz. Okay, good luck. Uh, Franz, uh, if a student comes to class very sad or distressed, um, whew, again, a good school would have a policy in process for this. Um, I I think it's, I think I'd tread carefully, especially if you're sort of a male teacher on with a young, with a, with a girl teacher or vice versa, that kind of thing. Um, but I think it's okay. Yeah, why not be human just to say um, what's wrong? But, you know, they'll probably just say nothing. And again, they might just want to be left alone a little bit, friends, you know. Okay. Uh, but I would ask your manager about that. Doreen, phonics to little ones? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, letter combinations, that kind of thing. You know, when you're drilling the vocabulary, you show the word as well as the picture. That kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, Janice, sight words. I'm not quite sure what sight words are. Um, I know is that like phonics? I'm not sure, Janice. Perhaps is, do I know it's something different? But I, I, I don't. I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I sound. I'm going to finish on a question that I've got no idea about. Sorry, Janice. Um, thank you very much, everybody. If you are still there, I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Um, please, if you did like it, please um, like it and please put in the comments as well that you liked it. We do like to know this kind of thing. Um, uh, thank you very much. If you've got any more questions, you can send us a message on uh, our Facebook page. You can join our Facebook group. We read all the comments. We also have a fantastic um, podcast that we've just started recently where um, we talk to people who have been teaching around the world. Um, I really, I'm really enjoying listening to it. I've learned some things from it, for sure. So that might be worth something that's worth look, looking at if you want to know a bit more. We've got loads of information on our website, tefl.org. Got blog pages, we've got jobs, we've got um, courses. You might want to do an add-on module um, in Young Learners if something like that's something that interests you, okay? Thank you very much for staying with us. Um, thank you for all the hellos that are coming in. Uh, have a good time, evening, wherever or morning, wherever you are in the world. Um